This is Tornado Talk, a podcast about one of nature's most fascinating phenomenon. Share your tornado story with us by email, Jen and Dan at tornadotalk.com. That's Jen and Dan at tornadotalk.com. Now, meteorologists Jennifer Naramore and Dan Holiday. Tornado Talk is on. Tornadoes are rare in Utah. How rare? The state averages just two tornadoes each year with an F2 or stronger twister once every seven years. The reason that tornadoes don't happen that often in Utah is because the climate is dry and the terrain is mountainous. There's only been 136 of them since 1950. August 11th, 1999 was different. A day when there would not only be a tornado, but a significant one that would carve through the biggest city in Utah. Severe weather slams Salt Lake City. Former meteorologist in charge of the National Weather Service in Salt Lake City, Bill Alder. First we thought it was just straight line damage, but then when we saw some of the pictures, we were watching mainly on in, in, the, in the television so we could see all the damage, so we knew we had something more to deal with than we anticipated at the beginning. Previously, the communications commander for 911 and police dispatch, Corey Lyman. One of our network technicians came running in the door and goes, there's a tornado out there. So I turned to the radio technician and go, yeah, right, probably never seen a, a little dust devil before. And Richard Turley, who was the manager of the historical and family department of the Latter-day Saints Church when the tornado hit. In Utah, encountering a tornado to me was like encountering an iceberg in the Sahara Desert. Completely unexpected. This is Tornado Talk. On August 11th, 1999, a rare tornado tore through Salt Lake City, killing one and injuring 80 others. It was the most destructive tornado in Utah's history and made everyone that lives there aware that tornadoes can truly happen anywhere. Just a year after the tornado struck, Bill Alder retired from the National Weather Service. He reflects back on the unusual setup that created a damaging killer tornado in Salt Lake City in 1999. We did have a cold trough going up, a, a cold upper air trough going through the area that morning, but basically it was rather innocuous type thunderstorm day, so we expected some thunderstorms, but not, not widespread or anything because of the, the gradients weren't there. We have a, a valley and uh, lake and valley wind pattern, which we get uh, winds off the Great Salt Lake in the afternoon, and the south winds in the south valley were still blowing. So this kind of created a, a, a convergence zone in the middle of the valley, and we had an old boundary at the same time. So the Ochre the Mountains are west of the uh, valley, and the thunderstorm started to develop over there about, about, about noon or so, or a little afternoon. And they started to increase in intensity, and then by 1235, the sudden distortion over the northwest part of the valley with the clouds topping up to 41,000 feet. And from then on, it continued to develop as it, as it rotated around through the, uh, around the Delta Center, which is, is in the western part of the valley, and became, uh, you know, a, a more of a circulation eventually getting to be an F2 category. Corey Lyman is now head of emergency management in Salt Lake City. When he was the communications commander for 911 and police dispatch the day the tornado struck, he first heard about it from a colleague down the hall at work. He was almost certain it was a joke. (laughs) I was at the public safety building on the ninth floor um, talking to some radio technicians. The ninth floor, half the building was... Um, the office space for our technical people and then half of it was an open roof area that you could walk out onto and I was up talking to the radio technician and uh, the door to the walkout part flew open and one of our uh, network technicians came running in the door and goes there's a tornado out there and he ran over he didn't go to the elevator he went to the stairs and went on down the stairs and I turned to the radio technician and go yeah right probably never seen it a little dust devil before or something. I just didn't even believe him. It was just that far out. (laughs) Anyway, so I finished what I was doing. I took the elevator down to the fifth floor where my office is. And as I walked down the hall toward my office, I can see all these people spilling out of the little hallway and office out into the main hallway from my office, which faced to the north. And so I get up there and I look over the top of them and we're just watching this tornado as it goes up over the top of the hill to the north of the building. <laughs> I went, oh, dang, it was a tornado. <laughs> 
anyway, subsequently I found out this guy, the network technician, was from South Dakota. He clearly knew what a tornado looked like. The tornado began doing damage during the noon hour at about 12.41 p.m. From KUTV-TV, listen to this from Sterling Polson. I am downtown Salt Lake. You cannot believe what has just happened. A tornado has gone through downtown Salt Lake. It started just southwest of the Delta Center. It has ripped the roof off the Delta Center. Oh, my goodness. It has gone into the, I don't know if it's the Double Tree anymore, but it's the hotel that's right across. Oh, my God. It's right across the street. From the, I can't breathe. The triad Center. It has now moved. The tornado has now lifted, lifting back up in the sky, but it has gone clear across just to the east of the Triad Center, Look across the, the parking lot place by the Genealogical Library, just behind the Genealogical Library. The tornado has now lifted off. But it has done some major damage here in downtown Salt Lake City. Richard Turley became familiar with tornadoes after spending his childhood in Iowa, but worked in Salt Lake City in 1999. He was having lunch with his two aunts that day on the eighth floor of a condominium. That's where the storm would pass almost overhead. And so I walked out onto the balcony and found myself right in the center of the funnel. The tornado itself had started in the west and had moved in an east-northeasterly direction to the mouth of City Creek Canyon, which is where this condominium building was located. And as I looked up into the funnel, I saw things rotating around the funnel that I didn't understand fully at the time. One thing I saw was I saw a large piece of white vinyl, maybe 60 feet long. It was folded, and it was circling on the inside of the funnel. That turned out to be a portion of one of the tents that was torn down at the outdoor retailers convention where there was a fatality from the tornado. I also saw lots of trees and tree parts in the circulating air rotating around me. I should have been frightened, I suppose, because one of those pieces of debris could have hit me in the head and killed me instantly, but it was so fascinating. I just stood there kind of fixed looking at the inside of the funnel The tornado worked its way into the mouth of the canyon, up into Memory Grove, where it tore up a very significant grove of trees, which then got caught up in the the funnel itself. And then the side of the canyon acted somewhat like a ramp, because as the tornado continued up, it got to the edge of the canyon, it it hit a power line, there was a big flash and sparks as the, the transformer blew. And then the tornado went airborne, and I could see just the tail of the tornado continue up towards the University of Utah. And after watching it for a while, I then walked inside, sat back down at the table, picked up my knife and fork, and continued to eat. My aunts looked up and said, was it a tornado? And I confirmed that it was. Uh, By this time, the lights were off in the building, but there was enough sunlight coming in through their windows that we were able to finish our meal, and then I walked down the stairs since the power was out in the building. I had to step around a tree with a large root ball. It was dropped at the front of the building, which was basically when I was in the funnel, that was behind me. So I dropped a tree there. I walked around that and I walked down the street. There were tree limbs all over and I walked into the 28 story church office building in downtown Salt Lake city where I had my office. I got in the elevator. Power was on there they had backup power i went up the elevator to the fifth floor and when i got to the fifth floor and the elevator doors opened i felt a breeze and in a an office building that would normally be completely self-contained with self-contained air circulation i knew that a breeze was not a good sign so i walked around to the north facing office of one of my colleagues mel thatcher and I found his desk and everything that was in his office piled up against the south wall. The tornado had picked up a piece of concrete ceiling tile, roughly the size of a, a section of sidewalk, and had th- tossed it through his window and smashed everything up against one wall. Gratefully, because it was the noon hour, he was out having lunch at the time. Otherwise, he would have been killed. Bill Alder was meteorologist in charge at the National Weather Service in Salt Lake City and says that day was almost like a blur. Well, when this happened, uh, the phone wouldn't quit ringing, especially around 12.30, 1 o'clock, and it wouldn't quit ringing because we were getting calls from 
the Weather Channel. We were getting calls from uh, from uh, Europe. We were getting calls from uh, the, the, all the affiliates in New York were calling. And they all wanted to know all the details. Well, we didn't know much of the details at the time. But Vince, first we thought it was just straight line damage. But then when we saw some of the pictures, we were watching because power was out, but, but some of the TV stations were down right at, the, right at where it would happen. And so we were watching what happened you know, mainly on, in, in, the, in the television so we could see all the damage. So we knew we had something more to deal with than we have, have anticipated at the beginning. So we knew we probably had a tornado at the time. Trouble was, we didn't get many calls in because the cell coverage downtown went out, par went out, and so that made it a real hard to get exact facts. So thank goodness some of the TV stations had backup power, which helped us to, to see what was going. We had backup power in the office too, help us see what was going on. And so this, this continued all afternoon, and I didn't get out of the office that night until about 10 o'clock. And uh, I don't know how much if I would have stayed, how much longer it would have lasted. But anyway, I let the other guys handle the calls. So that was the situation. And then we realized what we really had to deal with. Corey Lyman and his team were swamped, also handling incoming 911 calls after the twister wreaked havoc across Salt Lake City. You know, actually, the first responders immediately, of course, calls were coming into dispatch. And half those people spilling out into the hallway where dispatchers and 911 call takers had seen the tornado going by on the west side of the building where their windows faced and then went to my office to watch it go on north but um, they immediately of course went back to their call stations and the, the phones immediately were ringing off the hooks and and uh and and so they just dispatched like they would normally with you know fire rescue units and and emergency medical units responding to the scene um and then police officers as well going down to help with traffic control those kinds of things um they they did they did well they're used to you know organizing and and taking care of business as far as that goes other than the fact that they couldn't talk to each other very well um, and I, I give you an example, another lieutenant who was a very good friend of mine, I, I, as I'm back listening to and monitoring the, the air on the radio, and he comes over and he says, this is so-and-so, I'll contact the fire department and tell them they need to send their bat- battalion chief over to our command post at this location. And uh, anyway, I called him on his cell phone and I said, hey, whose incident is this anyway? And he goes, oh. Then you hear him back on the radio, and it's like, okay, now dispatch, go tell them where where is their command post? I'm heading over there, kind of thing. Cause, and and this it was a rescue medical event, not a police event. And so, but that the whole relaying of things from dispatch at police to fire and back and forth was pretty much had been the norm for many many years, uh, and it it proved to be you know cumbersome. At that time. First responders were trying to treat the injured and keep the city in order following the chaotic storm. Corey Lyman said the challenge was keeping different levels of government in communication with each other. It was worse than, than I mean, just our police and fire. We had a protocol that was set up. I mean, fire dispatch was across the hall from the police dispatch, so it wasn't very far and they could message each other, that kind of thing. But the other agencies, for example, the sheriff's office was in a completely different band. The state police were in a completely different band still, and they couldn't talk directly to their fire services. You had a lot of kind of communication silos with the different entities, and and we were well into the process of switching over to a common radio system in 1999, but we hadn't made the switch yet, so it really confirmed our, our need to do that. Richard Turley still works for the Latter-day Saints Church today, but in a different role than he did in 1999. He recalled how suddenly the storm hit, and may have caught many people off guard. You know, when I lived in the Midwest, we had tornado warnings that would come on all the time on television. In fact, three of the last five days I was in Iowa, I was down in my basement because of tornado warnings. But in Utah, encountering a tornado to me was like encountering an iceberg in the Sahara Desert, completely unexpected. Bill Alder and his team at the National Weather Service had limits in how quickly they could warn residents. The conditions that day resembled situations that occurred many times before where there were afternoon thunderstorms. We have a radar a promontory point, which is in the northwest of the of airport, and it's west of Brigham City, which is the northwest part of the state. And it's up at about an elevation of six, 7,000 feet. So time it gets down to the valley here, even the lowest angle, 
overshoots the majority of the valley. And so we didn't have any any really representation of that on the radar to, to go out and go with. And it was, in a, it was one that was not moving in fully. It was one that was developing right over the middle of the valley. So we had tornado genesis, if you want to call it that, right over the middle of the valley. Bill says the tornado was on the ground for about eight minutes. It tracked from southwest to northeast across Salt Lake City. The twister ripped through everything it touched. Meteorologist Bill Alder says even when reviewing the radar, it still wasn't evident to forecasters how significant that storm was. We reviewed the radar uh, later, and it still it still didn't pick it up that good. I mean, there was you know you were some hints because you were looking right at that area, but if you were just looking at that area on a, on a regular day, you wouldn't you wouldn't that wouldn't light any lights. Fifteen to twenty out of eighty injuries were serious. Tragically, one person lost their life. His name was Alan Crandy. When winds from the tornado caused a large outdoor tent to collapse at the outdoor retailers convention, Crandy was killed. Corey Lyman talks about how it happened. It was the day before it was supposed to start. It's one of the biggest conventions that we have in Utah. And at that point, the Salt Palace, was, which is the convention center, was uh, gearing up to expand, but it hadn't yet. So they set up a, a huge tent to, to augment their convention floor space. And so it was all being set up. And, and uh, you know, only a few people were in there relative to how it would have been 24 hours later when it would have been completely full of people. So we were fortunate on that front. But, you know, it, it kind of shows you the, how unprepared as, as we, we were in Utah for this. I mean, I tell you that I, I went down to the office and all these people went immediately to the windows to watch the tornado, and which is exactly what you don't want to do when there's a tornado because it's dangerous. A number of the injuries that were sustained were people that, you know, when the windows blew out, it, it got them. So that was, I mean, part of the, I mean, I think there were like 80 people injured. For Salt Lake City, a tornado causing F2 damage is significant for a state that may only have two tornadoes in a year. Meteorologist in charge that day at the National Weather Service, Bill Alder, was part of the damage survey team. Well, we saw a lot of tree damage. We saw a lot of uh, cars even damaged. And uh, we right at, at the one time, we, we had the outdoor retailers convention here. And they had tents just west of the Delta, Delta Center set up. And uh, the tenants were all ripped up, of course. And then it, as it tracked that way up through the grove, we saw some, some wind windows blown out of the Wyndham Hotel. We saw they were building a new, uh, the, the uh, LDS were building a new temple there. And I saw the scaffolding was all over the ground, a lot of tree damage, car damage. 300 buildings or houses were damaged and 34 homes were left uninhabitable. 500 trees, is our best estimation, were destroyed. Another 300 trees were significantly damaged. A portion of Membry Grove was completely destroyed. And a major power outage occurred in the downtown area of Salt Lake and Capitol area and the portions of the avenues. Estimated damage in those days, dollar-wise, was $170 million. The power was out, so we didn't get a lot of reports in because the no cell phone was damaged in the course of the power. We were watching most of this on one of our local TV stations that had backup power, and they were right on the scene. So we could see at the time, you know, as it became apparent, that it was more than straight-line winds because we saw debris always, which, all which ways, not just one way. Memory Grove is a unique part of Salt Lake City that bore the brunt of the tornado on that August summer afternoon. Corey Lyman described how the storm's path took it right into that area. Well, and the path that the tornado traveled okay it set down just to the uh, west and south of of downtown and then it rolled right across downtown and then it set back down at uh, the mouth of what's called uh, city creek canyon and the, and the very mouth of the canyon is a park called memory grove and it's got you know war memorials and uh, it's a really nice little park and it had tons of trees i think we lost four or five hundred trees that day and so it went right up memory grove and the capital if you come up the sides of the canyon to the top edge of it the capital is on the west side of memory grove and so it tore up a bunch of the trees and just totally made it look 
like something we didn't recognize, and then continued on up City Creek Canyon, and then actually up over what we call City Creek Peak. I mean, it's just if you if you envision it, it's a, it's a fairly small canyon. Probably you could call it a ravine if you wanted, with a creek running down the middle of it, lots of trees, lots of the benches and walkways, and um, some you know museum type things. It's just a really nice park. There have only been two lives claimed by tornadoes in Utah. The one that occurred with this storm and a young girl killed on July 6th, 1884. Since 1950, 112 people have been injured by twisters in the state and 80 of those all occurred on one day, August 11th, 1999. How long before another killer tornado strikes Utah? Odds are it won't happen soon, but then again, the odds could be wrong. Richard Turley says that day changed the way residents react to severe weather. Residents of Salt Lake City today don't think of tornadoes as something that couldn't happen here because we had that one and then subsequently there have been news reports of others. I was building a new home in the southwest part of the Salt Lake Valley and went out one day to check on the construction. I was standing talking to my neighbors and I looked up at the sky and saw the kind of color I got used to in Iowa when tornadoes were were likely to happen and I looked up and saw some rotation and I pointed it out to my neighbors and I said that looks like a tornado and sure enough I got home and listened to the news reports and a funnel touched down east of where we were so tornadoes do happen in in Utah including the Salt Lake Valley. Next on Tornado Talk, he's a meteorologist, structural and forensic engineer, and has conducted thousands of storm damage surveys. His research is uncovering unknowns, helping us learn more and more about tornadoes. Tim Marshall on episode 17 of Tornado Talk. This has been Tornado Talk. Take a moment to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Just search for Tornado Talk. Tornado Talk is free to you, but not free to produce. If you love what you hear, please support the show by becoming a member of Team Tornado Talk. It helps keep us going. Your monthly membership starting at $5 a month can earn you cool rewards like a Tornado Talk t-shirt, cap, koozies, and more. Plus, you'll always find free access to our past episodes. Just click the Patreon button online at tornadotalk.com.